thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel, strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing If you haven't uh, received the elements, they are on the back tables um, behind where you're seated. So if you need to, to get up and go grab those, feel free. This morning we have the wonderful privilege of taking the Lord's Supper together. And this is a, a wonderful time. It's a celebratory occasion. And it's fruitful in bringing about consistent repentance in our lives. Before we begin, I, I want to invite everyone who's a believer in Christ to participate this morning, regardless of where you regularly go to church. The only exception for our celebration is those who have not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and those who are under church discipline here or at any church. If you've not repented of your sins and put your faith and trust in Christ, or if you're currently under church discipline, please refrain from the Lord's table this morning. Please instead just watch and listen, because what we're celebrating is really an invitation for you to do something better than eat a cracker and drink juice. It's an invitation for you to enjoy the freedom in Christ that is symbolized in this wonderful ordinance. So let's just take a moment uh, while uh, the musicians play quietly and um, go to God. Ask God to search your heart. Confess any unrepentant sin this morning so that we can approach him with joy. One of the greatest blessings of the Lord's Supper each week is that it is one of the healthiest things that we can do as a church body. And what I mean by that is that the Lord's table, while a celebration of remembrance, also consistently brings us face to face with any lingering sin in our lives. And, and I've spoken with some of you who have remembered that the Lord's table is coming on Sunday. And, and have even dreaded the Lord's Supper because you would have to face your sin. And that's precisely one of the great functions of the Lord's table. It's fruitful in bringing consistent repentance or bringing us towards 
repentance. Some of you might still question why we do this every week, why go over the same things. Well, one of the many reasons is that it enriches the spiritual health of our church body. Our church body experiences greater spiritual growth and greater unity and greater love for God when we're consistently faced with our sin. It's the blood of Jesus which should be on our minds and our hearts regularly, not only for worship, but also to help us wage spiritual war against the flesh. Peter gives us a great reminder of what's uh, in, in what is not a typical communion passage. He links our spiritual obedience to the blood of Christ, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 14. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Not with, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Peter uses the deep truth of what Jesus' blood has accomplished. He, he uses that as a call for our holiness. But there's one particular command that Peter gives here that I just want to point out this morning in, in verse 17 of um, 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Fear. A holy fear of God. It is this fear that should drive us to obedience. This fear is an overwhelming reverence, respect, complete helplessness at the hands of an all-powerful God. Fearing God means knowing I can't sin without God seeing Fearing God means I can't disobey God and expect no consequence. Fearing God means I cannot run from Him and yet expect to, to somehow escape His powerful hand of control and discipline in my life. But Peter tells us that our fear should be done with remembrance. He says in verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed. Why? Why should the ransom Jesus uh, uh, paid in Jesus' blood, be at the center of our fear of God. Because in that ransom, because of that ransom, we, we are reminded of, of two things. One, that the God we fear loves us deeply. The God we fear loves us deeply. Jesus paid our ransom with his blood. And number two, we are reminded that the God we fear has purchased us. That means we're not our own. He loves us deeply, and he has purchased us. We are loved, we are purchased. That informs our fear of God. Not just that he is all-powerful and that we cannot escape his gaze, but that we are also his, his beloved. And friends, that's one of the things we, we must remember at the Lord's table this morning. God wants you to live holy, set apart, Live in obedience to God out of a heart that fears God because he loves you and he has paid a great price. The Lord's table for you today may be the wake-up call that you needed this week so that you can confess your sin and repent and turn to Jesus and live as he's called you to live and to fear the one who loves you and has purchased you. And friends, that's one of the healthiest things that we can do as a church. If you haven't opened your package this morning, go ahead and peel off the layers. And I'd like to ask one of our deacons Steve Johnson, to please come pray before we eat the bread together. All right. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, it's a, 
a marvelous picture of you paying for our sins. And uh, Lord, all we can say is thank you and um, just empower us to serve you and praise you. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, as often as you eat this and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And I'd like to ask one of our deacons, Josh Johansson, to please pray before we drink together. Lord, we thank you also for this cup in which we have been reminded of your blood that was poured out for us. Thank you that we are able to do this every week and how it is a healthy reminder, God, of our own sin. And how just help us all, Lord, to fear you, God, that you are all powerful and all holy and our sin before you. God, just help us to continue to remember that, but also thank you for your love, Lord, and for your blood that was poured out on our behalf. We are eternally grateful, Lord, and it's in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's drink together in remembrance of him. And let's all stand together and continue worshiping the Lord with singing.
Let's pray together. Father, what a joy it is to be here proclaiming your power and glory and the greatness of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray now that you would be honored as we look into your word, that our hearts would be softened by your spirit, that you would change the way we think, that you would give us new desires, passions, in order to follow you, reflect you, and impact the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his great name. Amen. You may be seated. It's great to see everyone this morning. Feels like it's been a while since I've actually been up here with you. I think the last time I was uh, scheduled to preach in Micah, uh, I uh, asked Pastor Brian to fill in for me because I was headed out of town. And, uh, of course, he's the Micah expert, so he uh, gladly filled in. Right, Brian? <laughs> he really does love the minor prophets, for those of you who uh, don't know Brian well, and he said that uh, the last time he preached. You know, I'm indifferent about some things. I don't know about you, but I am. Uh, food, for example. I'm, I'm indifferent about food. I like so many different kinds of food that when it comes to choosing a place to eat, um, I really don't care. I mean, it's not that I'm just putting off making a decision. I really don't care. I think for years my wife thought I was just putting off making the decision, you know, being indecisive, so she always was always challenging me to lead until she suddenly realized that it just frustrated me not to know if she had a preference that I started just saying, okay, we'll flip a coin. And uh, that sometimes got a response, well, no, wait, there's one place on there that I don't want to go, right? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, when I said I didn't care, I didn't care because I, I like food. I'm indifferent to it. Now, now sometimes... That doesn't always work out, right? Uh, sometimes I tell people I eat lunch with, hey, I, I don't care. I, I love trying new things. You pick the place, and uh, they pick a place. And it's, it's not my favorite, but I still, you know, it's like, hey, okay. Uh, I'll make sure I don't flip the coin that time. Next time, I will just choose, right? But that rarely happens for me. So I'm usually indifferent to food. But there are a lot of things that we can't be indifferent to. To be indifferent uh, in those cases would either be costly or dangerous. Our passage this morning addresses one of these things. It's spiritual indifference. We cannot be indifferent to God. And we cannot allow ourselves to become quietly indifferent to God. We cannot allow ourselves, like the writer of the sermon to the Hebrews said, we drifting away slowly, right? There's this, this drifting away from God. And suddenly we find ourselves spiritually indifferent to Him. Spiritual indifference is disastrous. It was disastrous. For the nation of Israel. That's what our passage will show us this morning. And we've seen the effects of it throughout the book of Micah. It was dangerous and costly, this spiritual indifference. And it would continue to be dangerous and costly. And in one sense, spiritual indifference is so costly that it costs that which is priceless. This morning, as we look at our text together, I want you to ask this question of yourself. Have I become spiritually indifferent? Now, you may wonder, what evidence should we look for to answer that question? 
Or maybe, what can we do about it? If the answer to that question is yes, I think God will help us this morning with that. Today, we begin the third oracle of the prophet Micah. So, go to chapter 6 in your copy of the Bible. We are going to continue on in our series in Micah through December. And so, this morning, I get to begin the third oracle of chapter 6. Each of Micah's prophecies is marked out by the command to hear or listen. That's what they begin with, and so that's how we know this is the first oracle of Micah, the second oracle of Micah, and the third oracle of Micah. Each of them lays out a cause for judgment, a promise by God to execute that judgment, and then another promise by God to provide renewal and restoration. This last oracle which goes to the end of the book, is no different. Each oracle clearly demonstrates our theme for the book, that the faithfulness of a fearsome God is the foundation of our hope. If you've been here throughout the whole series, you are well aware of the fearsomeness of God. Some of the language in Micah can be very uncomfortable for modern ears. Just things that we don't like to think about, that we don't like talking about, that we don't like to think apply to God, and yet they are God's very words. I suppose many today might scrub some of God's words from Micah out of the Bible if they could because they're so uncomfortable But that's what makes this theme so important. It is the faithfulness of this fearsome God that is the foundation of our hope. The fact that God will be faithful to be fearsome when it calls for it. When it means upholding His end of a covenant promise. God doesn't turn His back on that. He's not afraid of modern sensibilities. He doesn't really care if people think it appears mean or cruel or unloving. God says, I made a promise, I made a covenant, and I will carry it out. And the promise I made and the covenant I made was to be fearsome when it called for it. And He's demonstrated that to Israel time and again. But if he will be faithful to that covenant promise, then he will be faithful to all of these promises for renewal and restoration. And in that, we find hope. We find hope. So look at Micah chapter 6 and follow along as I read verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Arise. Plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened to him, Shittim and Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord." With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. 
And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? This book has been filled with evidence of Israel's wickedness. The words of Micah's prophecies have revealed rampant selfishness, heinous sin, and open idolatry. Israel has proven unfaithful to God. Unfaithful to Him and unfaithful to the covenant they made with God centuries before. In that covenant, God called them to be a nation of priests. He called them to be mediators to the world. Listen to these words from Exodus 19. They're not on the screen. Just just listen to them. Think about them. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the people of Israel, Moses. Tell them this is what I want for them. This is who I'm calling them to be. Were these words from Deuteronomy 4. Moses speaking, see, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? They were to be a nation of priests. They were to mediate God to the world But based on what we've heard in the first five chapters of Micah, they have failed. They have failed that calling. Today in our passage, God uses courtroom language to charge Israel once again with covenant unfaithfulness. And our passage reveals the indifference of Israel to her relationship with God. The case God lays out is beyond question. The proof is easy to see. In verses 1 and 2, God calls the nation to defend herself to the mountains and the hills. It's figurative language. But it's very specific language when you think about how God is using it and why he is using it. It was on the mountain that Israel entered into that covenant relationship with God. Mount Sinai, there God delivering those, that covenant promise and calling Israel to make her own promises to him, which they did. So God calls the mountains as witnesses, and it is on the hills in the surrounding countryside of Israel that they go to to practice their idolatry. The high places where they have set up shrines, objects of worship, false gods. God calls the mountains and the hills to witness His indictment, and God is certain that his indictment will be held up by these witnesses. He has no doubt of it. But verse 3 is an interesting insertion here. 
As he calls the witnesses together to hear the indictment and he calls Israel to contend for herself, to give her answer and explanation for this indictment, you would expect the next words to be thunderous because we have heard thunderous words from God. He's the great mountain melter, right? From chapter 1. And yet here, it's not the thundering judgment you might expect but words of tenderness. Look at verse 3. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? You know, God often used the imagery of marriage to describe His relationship to Israel. He played the role of husband, and she played the role of wife. And here you have the pleading words of a husband, maybe to his indifferent wife or his unfaithful wife. How have I let you down? What have I done? Tell me, I, I want to know. You hear the words behind it. I, I, I feel like I've tried to give everything here. Why do you treat me with such indifference? Those are the words of God here. His words say, what I see in you seems to be disinterest in me. Apathy. And it is with these words that God then begins to present His case their indifference. And what we see here is that spiritual indifference is easy to prove. So as we look at these next five verses together, I want you to test yourself. I want you to use the charges against Israel as tests for yourself. Have you become spiritually indifferent? So the first test this morning of spiritual indifference is this. Is the work of God on your behalf important to you? Is the work of God on your behalf important to you? Look at verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 opens with the little word for. He's like, how have I wearied you? Answer me because this is who I've been. This is the husband I've been to you. This is the God I have been to you. This is for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. In Genesis 15, God revealed to Abraham that his people would spend 400 years somewhere else. That they would experience hardship and trouble and that God would deliver them from that. 400 years! But God had already told that to Abraham long before they ever entered Egypt. And then Exodus reveals the story of God fulfilling that promise. The most powerful nation on earth at the time held Israel as its slaves. And God brought that nation to its knees. He didn't need his people to do it. He did it. You were slaves. You were inconsequential to the world. And I redeemed you. You were in the lowest place possible for a human being at that time. And I intervened and redeemed you. I redeemed you. Is my work on your behalf not important to you? He says, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. I provided leadership to guide you. I provided a priesthood to instruct you in the covenant and to intercede for you. And I provided prophets and prophetesses to call you to me. 
so that you might know me for who I truly am. Is my work on your behalf important to you? This has been our history, your history. God continues, oh, my people, remember what Bala, king of Moab, devised and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. You know that story, but maybe you don't. Balak, king of Moab, he was worried about Israel, sought out a prophet to curse them. He's going to pay him the big bucks, and the prophet was willing to do it. Willing to do it, but every time he opened his mouth, God caused words of blessing to flow for the nation. Words of blessing and promise that could not be stopped. It was not something that Balaam could control. God says, I didn't even let somebody curse you with their lips. Instead, I used it to utter blessings and promises that I would fulfill and will fulfill. And then finally, he says, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal? He's like, in Shittim, you were camped at the edge of the Jordan, and you could see the goal, the land of promise. But it was I who took you through the waters of the Jordan. It was I who brought you to the land. It was I who established that first camp at Gilgal in the land. It was I. And all of the things then that follow, that remind, that are to be reminders to the people here that God fulfilled His promise to Abraham by giving him, the, his people, his descendants, that land on that day. That God came through for them. He says, isn't the work that I have done on your behalf important to you? Why have you forgotten that work? Why do these things mean nothing to you? You know why. We're all like this a little bit. You've probably forgotten some of the things God has done in your life. But I think it's more like we're, like we're like Israel. Israel's like us in this sense. We're always in the what have you done for me lately mindset. Yeah, God, that stuff is great. What have you done for me lately? Where were you when I needed you to do this for me? This was really important to me, God. And you said no. Problem is, with all those things that God listed, he was never meant to be a genie. He was always meant to be a faithful promise keeper. And in those things, he faithfully kept his promise. But he is not our, at our command. But we want him to be, don't we? Why did Israel turn to idols? Because there were crops that were not as abundant as they thought they should be, and so they prayed to fertility goddesses. They turned to idols that might help them in achieving greater prosperity or might fulfill other desires and dreams that they had that God was not fulfilling for them. The past is great, God, but what have you done for me lately? Do you feel that God needs to continue to prove Himself to you?
Or maybe it's just that God said no to something that you thought was really important and you feel that God has let you down. Like, God, maybe you would have done this if you would have just shown me how to pray or, or what I needed to do to make this happen, but you let me down here. I don't know what it was that was driving Israel, but she had grown spiritually indifferent. The past works of God were not sufficient to drive her present motivation to love Him with all her heart and to serve Him and Him alone. So are you growing spiritually indifferent to the work of God in the past? Know this, my friend, just because you don't think God is working doesn't mean that He has stopped working. In fact, the New Testament tells us that what he starts, God will finish. He's not done with you yet. And maybe you believe that, but what you don't like is the way God is doing that particular work. Now I'm speaking primarily to those who have place their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Only you can really answer this question. If you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then God is not your God, and Scripture tells us that you are still God's enemy. But if you have placed your faith in Him, then answer this question. Is the work God is doing on your behalf enough? Is the work He's done on your behalf enough? Or are you secretly wanting more from Him? Is the work of God important to you? There's a second test that I want you to see. It's this. Ask yourself, is the seriousness of sin important to you? Is the seriousness of sin important? important to you. Micah here, speaking with the voice of the people answering um, God, with these absurd statements, with, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come with burnt offerings, calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Each statement here becomes progressively greater and greater. Micah is speaking for the nations like, okay, okay, God, okay, what will make this right? What, what, what can solve the problem here? Clearly, you, you know, you, you're upset. So what do we have to do? Do we, do we need to bring, you know, do we need to bring a burnt offering? That was the most costly offering. None of the offering was reserved. No one else could enjoy any of the offering. The burnt offering was totally consumed. It was a total sacrifice of the animal. Is, it, is that what you want, a total sacrifice? Or how about a, a calf a year old? A year old calf meant that you had to put a year's worth of food and labor into raising that calf. It was an even greater sacrifice than maybe a, a seven, eight day or a two week old calf, right? Or what about thousands of rams? That was the sacrifice of kings. That's how Solomon sacrificed to the Lord. Thousands of rams. How about that, Lord? Will that make you happy? This is Micah speaking for the people. Or rivers of oil, an impossible amount of oil. But nothing compared to a child. The firstborn, the heir, for most this would be everything. And though forbidden, It was the example here of the ultimate sacrifice. Just tell us what you want, God, and we'll give it to you so you can be happy. Do you see the problem there? Is they were focused on the wrong side of the equation. The reason that sacrifice was even necessary was because they do not see the seriousness of their sin. Oh yeah, we sin, so we bring something to you. 
That makes everything okay. God's point here and His point in countless places throughout the Old Testament is those sacrifices offered with that kind of heart are meaningless to me. Meaningless to me. And dangerous for you. Because they show a callousness towards sin and indifference Michael said this morning to holiness righteousness they're dangerous Isaiah described the people in this state Isaiah 29:13 and the Lord said because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. He's like, they they talk a good game, they show up and they offer the required sacrifices, but their heart is not in it. They're callous towards the covenant and they are callous towards their own sin. Is the seriousness of sin important to you? God has always wanted the heart What is revealed here is that they were just looking for a way to get back into God's good graces. Okay, you're upset. What do we have to do? We'll we'll go all the way to the top if you need it, God. You just ask for it. We'll give it to you, right? That's what you want. No, that's not what I want. There was a man who understood this. David understood this. David understood this. Look at the words of Psalm 51. David said, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. David understood. This was after David David wrote this psalm after he had committed heinous acts of sin. And he understood there is no amount of animal sacrifice or grain and, and oil and other... If I just brought it all, if I dumped all the gold and everything, there is nothing I can do. I am completely dependent upon the grace and the mercy of God to forgive me for what I have done. David understood. So let me ask you, is the seriousness of sin important to you? Are you learning to love what God loves and hate what God hates? Is it important to you? If not, maybe you are spiritually indifferent. There's a third test that I want you to see. It's in verse 8. Answer this test question. Is the simple teaching of Scripture important to you? Is the simple teaching of Scripture important to you? The plain teaching, the clear teaching, is that important to you? What do we need to bring, God? He has told you, O man, what is good. Here's Micah pointing out their problem. They don't take sin seriously. And then pointing to the sin. He's told you what's good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Very similar to what God said to them through Moses in Deuteronomy 10. Look at these words in verses 12 and 13. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you 
but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord which I am commanding you today for your good. These words of Micah 6, 8 are all over the Old Testament. God calling out to his people. He says, what does the Lord require of you? Firstly, just to do justice. To do justice. We've had that defined throughout the book. We saw er, in earlier chapters the way people were treating each other in Israel, taking advantage of each other. The rich were oppressing the poor. People were stealing from one another. It was chaos. The leaders were taking bribes and, and getting rich off the people. To do justice. The simplest understanding of doing justice is to treat people right. To live with integrity. To show impartiality. To not be swayed by bribes or power or privilege, you know, to not be wowed by someone's um, fame or fortune and to give them honors that you wouldn't extend to others who lack that same place. It can also mean helping those who are unable to help themselves, to look out for those among us who have the least or, and need help. I mean, God often used the example of widows and orphans as those who seem to be taken for granted or taken advantage of in the Old Testament. They had very little power in biblical times. Today, those groups still need people to look out for them. But today, the largest group who still needs our voice is the unborn. I hope you never get tired of hearing that drumbeat. We must continue to pray and use our rights as citizens to fight for this group that is utterly powerless. Even orphans can steal to provide for themselves. They can run to defend themselves. The widow can do something similar, but the unborn have no chance. And if I've offended you too bad, Because I think I stand with God on this one. And I'm willing to discuss it with you all day long. And we better be praying right now because there is a chance that some things could happen. But only God can turn the human heart to do what is right. People today are clamoring for justice. But there is one group that needs us, and we must not abandon them in this moment. Is the simple teaching of Scripture important to you? You say, I'm all on board with that, Otto. I'm all on board with the unborn. But what about a life of integrity and just doing what's right or treating people impartially? Is that you? Is that you? Are you able to have relationships with people who aren't like you, who are socially a little more awkward than you, who are lower on the economic scale than you, who can't provide you any kind of, of counsel or help you uh, succeed in life? Is that who you are? Do you do, do you seek to just do what is right? And not right by what your heart tells you what is right, right by what God's word tells you is right. Is that where you are? Are you willing to take the risks that are associated with that? Are you ready to do that? Is the simple teaching of scripture important to you? Or are you spiritually indifferent? And to love kindness, to love kindness, 
sometimes translated as love mercy or faithfulness or have a loyal love. God is saying simply, I want you to reflect me. Truly, does God have to be kind to his enemies? Does he have to be gracious and merciful to his enemies? He would be just in simply exterminating all who sin against him. He is pure and holy. And yet, many of you sit here today because of God's loving kindness. God's love of mercy. God's abundant grace. And he calls you to reflect him. Do you love kindness? Mercy? I want you to be just because I'm just, God says. I want you to show mercy and kindness and faithful love because that's who I am, God says. God has always wanted the people who call themselves his people to reveal him to the world through their manifestation of his character. He has always wanted that. Remember that passage I read in Deuteronomy 4? He said, when the people see you living this way, they, we, I want them to marvel. That's God. Finally, he says, walk humbly. In that Deuteronomy 10 passage, the expression might be the fear of God. It's to honor God as God, to understand your place as the creature in relationship to the Creator. To understand the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and the awesome, fearsome power of God. Walk humbly with your God. James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5. That James and Peter understood this. They wrote, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You're a fool to walk before God in pride. You're a fool. Peter and James understood this. I'm sure if Peter looked back on his life, I mean... I'm sure when he read some of the things that people were passing around about him, he was just like, man, I was such an impetuous fool sometimes. But who hasn't been, right? And James, James was a part of the family that said, my brother is out of his mind. James, the Lord's brother. Jesus is out of his mind. I think he looked back on that with shame. What arrogance. Both men knew the fact that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Both men had been recipients of grace because they had humbled themselves before God. They understood and loved the simple teaching of Scripture. It was important to them. And God does give grace to the humble. It's grace that we all need. It's grace that is our only hope. In Micah, it is only the fact of God's mercy and grace and His faithfulness to be merciful and gracious that is their hope for the future. And it is our only hope in this face or in the face of spiritual indifference. What about you? Are you here today without the grace of God? From communion to earlier in my sermon, I'm, we talked about those who have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ. You might walk away from a passage like this and just say, hey, this is good. 
Uh, all I have to do is be for justice. Uh, all I have to do is start being a little more kind. And all I have to do is walk humbly before God. Yeah, and all you have to do is do that perfectly, and you have to have done that perfectly since day one. How are you doing on that test? I don't know if you're like me. You probably failed some of that test uh, this morning, right? Right? So what what hope is there? If Israel can't do it, God's chosen people, He gave them His law, He he defended them, He provided for them, He he gave them leaders, He gave them a priest to mediate, He gave them people to bring revelation. If If there's no hope for them, how is there any hope then for me? Jesus Christ is your hope. You see, Those sacrifices that were mentioned before because of the seriousness of sin, they went all the way to the top, and the answer was that none of those things were good enough to wipe out the the consequences of sin. But Jesus Christ is. God knew that. And that's why in the very beginning in the garden, God promised to send the one who came in Jesus Christ. God said, something's got to be done about sin, and I'm the only one who can do it, and my son will take care of it, and he did. You know how he did it? If you're here without Jesus, then your life is God's life. But when you die, it will not just be snuffed out. You will not just miss out on heaven. No, you will pay for offending the holiness of God for all eternity. And if that sounds offensive to you, and you're holding that to my account, forget it, because that's what God said. That's what Jesus said. And there is only one way out of that judgment. Because there was only one person who's ever lived who could take that judgment upon himself and offer you forgiveness. And that's Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus came to die in your place. He came to take the punishment that you deserve. All of the injustice that you have committed in your life, all of the unkindness that you have committed in your life, all of the pride that you have manifested in your life, and all of the other unnamed sins that you've committed can be laid upon Jesus, right, by God, and he can pay for them. He did pay for them. But will you come to him in faith? Will you believe that he was willing to pay for them? Will you humble yourself before God and say, God, I cannot pay for my sin. There is no hope for me. But Jesus is the hope that you've provided. If you come to him and place your faith in him, then you can be saved from the wrath of God. And if you have been here and listened to Micah, you know that wrath is a terrible wrath. And it will be that way for all eternity. Please throw yourself upon the grace and mercy of God and receive Christ today. And know eternal life. Know what it is to have an unbroken relationship with God. Know what it is to be freed from shame and guilt. Know what it is to be free from a slavery to sin. Know what it means to become the child of God. Know what it means for Jesus to call you family. Spiritual indifference costs Jesus his life. He died for your indifference my indifference and that indifference is easy to prove is the work of God on your behalf important to you is the seriousness of sin important to you is the simple teaching of scripture important to you if 
you don't know Jesus, come to him. If you know Jesus, then you must deal with your indifference because it is dangerous. Pray with me. Father, <clears throat> we're here because we need you. We're here because we believe this is a place that we can draw closer to you. Father, I pray for those now who, whose seat I sat in so many years ago. Draw them to yourself. God, open their eyes to the truth of the gospel. Open their eyes to Jesus. May they see him as the wonderful Savior. May they see him as Emmanuel, God with us. Father, save people today through your word. And Father, for those of us who have grown indifferent to your work and to the seriousness of sin and to the simple teaching of Scripture, God, reignite in us a passion for those things. Convict us through your spirit. Show us, Lord, the way in which we should walk. May today we begin praising you anew for the salvation that we have in Christ. May we begin to forsake sin that we have tolerated for too long. And may we honor you and reflect you in the workplace and in the world tomorrow. And we pray this in Jesus' name precious name. Amen. Stand with me and sing.
go ahead and be seated, if you will. Uh, a couple of things I want to share before we uh, dismiss uh, this morning, and um, some of you are going to enjoy the Chiefs game. Some of you are going to enjoy a nap. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, one of the more significant ministries that we can have uh, toward young moms in our church is through the nursery ministry. What a, an amazing ministry that is. Uh, what that does is it allows um, these young moms to be able to, to worship and, and attend uh, Bible class on Sunday morning. And I can tell you, there is a growing number of kids that would love to spend about an hour and a half with you every week. Would you consider maybe giving uh, a Sunday morning or evening uh, once every couple of months, month and a half or every couple of months? If you would do that, would you contact Stephanie Craven? Who, Stephanie, by the way, as of Friday is um, her ovarian cancer is officially in remission. So that's a blessing. Praise God for that. But Stephanie um, has said we've got a lot.